Welcome to the show today, and my guest is a friend and a teacher of mine, Patricia Woods, and she's a professor at American River College, and she is the director of the art gallery, the Kaneko Gallery, at American River College in Sacramento, California, and she is part of the permanent collection committee for American River College, which oversees all the art collection here at the college, including American River College being one of the 200 campuses in America that has part of the Andy Warhol estate. So welcome, Patricia. And I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about all these jobs you do. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this podcast show. I've never done one of these before. Yeah, so I'm a professor at American River College teaching arts, print right now, printmaking and drawing. And, um, you know, I, I like to say that I'm a flatlander, meaning that I don't do the three-dimensional, I do the two-dimensional, but I have been the director of the Kaneko Gallery since, so I think it was spring of 2016. It was after Mick Sheldon retired, I took over. So I've been doing that for two or three years now. I think it's two and a half years officially. So that means that I coordinate and put on all the shows in the Kaneko Gallery, which is the campus art gallery. Right. Well, can you tell Uh, us a little bit about those shows? Sure. I'm glad you're asking now because I still have most of them in my head, but I think in 10 years down the road, I'll have to look at a list. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I know because you have a lot. Yeah. It feels like we've done a lot, even though I've only been the director for a couple of years, but we do four shows a semester. So generally the opening show of the fall we do the faculty show. So we feature faculty work and it's a way for students to come and look at what the faculty does here. And then the closing show of the spring, which we're gearing up to right now, is the annual student competition. So that's a juried show. Last year we had close to a hundred students enter the show, but of course each student brings more than one entry, so we had close to 400 entries. And that got dwindled down to about 70 pieces that got into the show. And that's a massive undertaking. We have two days of people dropping off art. We bring in a juror from the outside. This year it'll be Barbara Range, who runs the Brick House Gallery. And she is the curator and director over there. And the Brick House does wonderful things. They also have art studios and poetry nights and bands and music. So Barbara's going to come out Wednesday, April 24th, the juror of the show. And then we have two days to return work that didn't get in and put the work up that did get in. And and that's just the start of it. After the work is up, um, various people will come in and give awards out. Actually, Barbara Range will pick the three or four big awards, best of show, first, second, third. Following week, the dean comes in. She picks her award. President of the college comes in, picks his award. We give away three ceramics award that uh, Linda Gelfman is in charge of those. There's a photo award, there's a People's Choice Award, and there's a Permanent Art Collection Award. So it's a really, really big deal for students, and it's also kind of a little bit of a fundraiser for the gallery, although most of the the entry fees go straight back to awards. So that's the big thing that's coming up right after spring break. But in addition to those two shows, each semester we feature three shows, various shows of different artists that we think are important to bring to campus. Either their work is innovative in materials or they come from a you know, background, their work is reflected in that, that our diverse student population can relate to. So we try to put on a variety of shows. As, as director, one of the things I have to think about is making sure that I'm featuring different medias. I'm a painter, so my brain always goes to painting, but I got to make sure mm-hmm. that there's ceramic shows. Right now we have a beautiful ceramic show up for one more week by Shenny Cruces. I need to make sure there's photo shows. So last December, the very closing show of last semester was Angela Casagrande's photography. She does encaustics with her photography in these sort of boxes that almost were like uh, camera obscuras. So we try to keep a variety in the shows. And my goal is always to have the next show be really different from the previous show. So we've been really good about doing that this semester. Our first show this semester was Rachel Clark's Art New Media show. 
there was a film, there was a room built in the gallery, there was a film shown, you had to put on a virtual reality headset to see part of the exhibition, and it was a lot of fun. We'd never done anything like that before. Then we brought Fanley Warren in from Oakland, who did paintings that relate to growing up in Chicago, and now we've got Shani Cruz's All Ceramics. So it's been a really fun semester. That's kind of how a little bit of insight in how I plot and plan who's going to show and, and when and where and trying to really bring in diverse shows that haven't been shown before, people who are doing really different things with art, both traditional and non-traditional arts. Yeah, I um, really like that new media show, and, and I have to commend you for building an actual room that actually had to be taken <laughs> out at the end, but <laughs> it looked seamless, like it belonged there, and it, then it was gone. <laughs> the builders did a great job, and I have to confess you know, when artists, I, I book way out to the future, okay? So we're booked into almost 2022 now. And one of the reasons I do that is because if you've ever dealt with artists, if you call an artist and say, can you show next month? They're going to be like, oh, no, you know, I'm not ready. Everybody wants time to prepare. A lot of artists like to make sure it's a new body of work. And so most artists are pretty happy when you say, can you show with us, but not until a year from now or two years from now. It gives them time to, to prep. So we did that with Rachel. I'd asked her about a year and a half ago, and she came in last, let's see, her show is in January. So she started to kind of come to the gallery and look around and do measurements at the end of last summer. So she was coming in, measuring tapes, kind of looking around and very contemplative, you know, and I just, just kind of sat there. I didn't, I had no idea what she was really going to do, but I trusted her because she's, you know, just a fabulous artist, and she does innovative stuff. And she did ask me at one point if she could build, if a chamber could be built to house a video. And I have to confess that I thought it was going to be a small box with a video projector in it. It wasn't <laughs> until they started building it that it became a whole entire room <laughs> that was really kind of like a mini theater because they needed it to be really dark. And I didn't build the wall myself. I'm not, I don't take any credit for that. I just sort of <laughs> sat there and watched these guys that she hired build this little room that people could go and sit in. And it was fascinating because they made it match the gallery walls, oh. the molding. They painted it the same, the, the baseboard. Yeah, everything it was, was the same. It was seamless. And, I was impressed. <laughs> and there were people that kind of came in and were like, was that room always here? <laughs> like, uh, no. But and it was a nice theater. <laughs> it was a very nice theater. The headphones, the pictures, and, and Rachel's a real perfectionist, which is actually those are the greatest people to work with because yeah. they really take care of what needs to be taken care of. So that was a lot of fun. The scary part was watching it all come down, and we had to do that in a weekend because we had to have the gallery return to normal for Fan Lee Warren's painting show. They were demolishing this thing in there the day that Fan had to drop off her paintings. And so it was like complete chaos. And I was like, oh, it's not usually this crazy here. I swear your paintings will be safe. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they were, it, that was fun, too, because we got it all done in a weekend. We got the whole structure taken down and the walls patched up and cleaned all in one day. And then we came in the next day, unpacked all of Fan's paintings that she drove down from Oakland and put up the entire show, got the labels up. And so people, when they came into the gallery Monday, were just baffled. You know, like, <laughs> wasn't there a room in here? What happened? And so that's kind of a lot of fun. We did that. The first year I was director, one of the things we did is um, Unity Lewis came and did a show. And he does graffiti, some kind of graffiti spray paint art. We coordinated with him because he's the grandson of Samela Lewis, who was like one of the biggest historians, art historians in the nation. She's the one that was cataloging all of the black arts movements when no one else was cataloging them. No one else was letting any of these artists into major museums, you know, so it's like back in the 50s and 60s, even, you know, pre when things were still segregated. And so he has this massive collection that he really helps his grandmother coordinate. She's still around. She's like 96, still paints oh, wow. every day. Yeah, she's pretty yeah. incredible. So we had to write a grant to get the big legend show, which included like the Jacob Lawrence and the Elizabeth Catlett pieces. Betty Sarr was in it. All these incredible artists from the Harlem Renaissance and the post-Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement. But that took some money. 
So in the meantime, I told you need a so well, why don't you have a show while we're waiting to get the money and he said okay i'm i'm you know i i got these ideas and and i allow for a lot of artistic freedom because i think it really if you let artists do things they'll come up with really cool things i only have one rule and that is that when the show is over the gallery has to be returned to exactly what it looked like before so I told him, I said, you can paint right on the walls. And he did. And and every day he would paint a little more. And so we'd hang a sign outside the door. It was, it was called the 14 Days of Unity Lewis because he had two weeks to finish it. And it was just going to remain for two weeks more. And then we were going to repaint the gallery. So it was interesting because there would be days when, when he came in. He started sort of coming in later and later because he's also a musician. So he's kind of a night owl. <laughs> So there were nights that he was just in the gallery most of the night. We told security and everything, you know. And there were times when you go in the next day and it didn't look like much was changed because he maybe worked on the detail of a hand or a figure for a long time. And then there would be times when we walk in the very next day and the whole back wall would be painted. And so there was just this huge black and white painting that he that was really a re he redid an image from a Samella Lewis woodcut that was that's his grandmother so he redid one of her images and it took up the whole entire back wall was just which is spray painted right and so eventually the whole gallery was painted and it was so colorful and then he hung a few of the legends pieces to show what they look like next to the pieces that you know the paint that he did and that was great fun because it was just sort of mind-blowing and then we came in of course after the show was over and repainted the whole entire gallery and people were just in shock because they'd walk in and it was like, what happened? <laughs> there are paintings in here. And I tell you, that was a really tough repaint job because it was, it was still raining. It was one of the rainiest seasons. So the paint wouldn't dry. We had to go over coats and coats and coats and paints. And sometimes when there's no artwork in there, I can squint and I can still kind of see some of the paint through there. <laughs> but that maybe is just me. But that's it probably uh, broke your heart a little it, to it have always, some cool art covered up with white really paint. It was really hard. It was really hard. It was really hard to paint over those because they were just gorgeous. But that's the nature of temporary art, you know. Yeah. And he did actually do something pretty cool where where he put a big canvas on each one of the walls. And so part of the wall was painted and part of it was canvas. It was seamless, like you wouldn't even notice the canvas. But So we did get to save a few pieces. Uh -huh. And we still have some of those pieces here he's loaned to us. And they're hanging in some of the Unite offices. But um, the show that we wrote the grant for, which was bringing his grandmother's, a part of his grandmother's collection, she has an enormous collection. That happened the following, the following year. That was in February and... Um, we got a foundation grant that allowed us to bring those pieces. Um, and those were all the famous pieces. Charles White, that was my favorite piece, I think. Charles White, there's a retrospect of his work down in Southern California, I think at the LACMA right now. And we had one of the pieces here. So oh, that's we had pretty exciting. Really, we had some pretty exciting pieces. We have a, a Jake, we had two Jacob Lawrences, and there's a big retrospect of Jacob Lawrence at the Crocker right now. And I think... New York is bringing his immigration series. So it's some really famous artwork. Some lots of good things came out of that because Unity came here and lectured. But the thing that really was exciting is that the school, we talked the school into, and it was really me and Sarah Matson into buying three of the pieces. They actually, because I think Samella Lewis and that whole family is so dedicated, not just to art, but to education. They allowed us to buy some of the prints, but they're real prints. They're serigraphs, silk screens, and woodcuts. So American River College now owns an Elizabeth Catlett linoleum cut print and a Jacob Lawrence silk screen and a Samella Lewis woodcut. So in addition to our vast Warhol collection, and the Warhol collection was gifted to us, as you said, photographs and silk screens were gifted to us. And that was Ken Magri that got those for us. And and you mentioned earlier that 200 colleges got gifts, but only, I think, only three community colleges got gifts. Are you sure there's three? I'm going to check on that because I had that. thought that American River College might be the only one, but I'll check. It might be the only one. I <laughs> I'll think put it in the show notes. Okay, <laughs> okay, put it in the show notes because I think there might be a couple more, but what happened is the foundation, because Warhol was so prolific, especially with his photography 
in some printmaking techniques that the foundation decided we should gift these for educational purposes to universities. And so if you were a university, you could request a gift of X many. I think ours is like 60 photographs and five prints. But Ken Magri um, contacted them and said, well, why do you have to be a university? Why can't we have some? And talked him into it. And you know, he was pretty fabulous. So wrote whatever he wrote, had the right grant request, and uh, we were gifted the Warhol. So, so we, have a, we have a pretty awesome collection here at American River College. Yeah, um, American River College has some beautiful art, for, and I think you're working on a project now to make it easier for people to find all these pieces on campus, which will be wonderful. Yeah. Speaking of two-dimensionals, there's a lot of ceramic work yes, <laughs> around the campus, yes. so, lots of murals. So we have all of these fantastic murals, mosaic ceramic murals. Right, and the painting. Um, and the painting. Now we have, that one is finally going to be done this weekend, so I'll talk oh. about that one. So Linda Gelfman, our ceramics teacher, started doing these just really incredible mosaic ceramic murals with a class so they'd be done in class and they'd get mounted all around campus and so there's the science one of the sciences now we have finally have our own in in the art department right there's the dragon one that's outside the kiln so there's all these incredible ceramic murals that are on campus and then a couple of years ago we we got some money to uh, do a call to artists to do some sculptures outside the new student now it's called the Student Welcome Center. And the, lots of local artists applied for that, and the person who was chosen was Garu Galdi. And so we've got these, I think they're beautiful, these three statues. They almost look like the Nike of Samothrace outside of the Students Center. And then we were able to get Ruby Chacon, who is an incredible muralist, to come out here and work with students. And for the past year, we've been working on a painted mural outside of the Learning Resource Center. I'm kind of blathering about all this stuff because when I first became director, I would have groups kind of dawdling into the gallery every once in a while, sort of saying, well, is there any other work we can see on campus? Yeah, we get a lot of groups of students that come from the centers for students with disabilities that are close by and they want to take tours. And I started thinking, you know, we need a map. We need a map because, you know, I'm just out here pointing. Yeah, if you go that way, you'll find this. Or this you know, right. Map. And of course, you know, my, my brain, my non-techie brain is like, let's make a paper map. <laughs> and, <laughs> and someone else was actually Don Reed in printing said, no, you need to geotag it and make an online kind of map because that's what he did with all of the trees for, you know, the for botany, earth, sciences, or earth sciences. Earth sciences. They started geotagging different trees, right? We attempted to do it for one of the art gallery classes. I teach these art gallery operations classes. Attempted to do it with our cell phones. But we found out that the more you transfer files from a phone to a computer, the, the more information you lose in terms of its geographical location. So we, we kind of gave up on that a little bit. But I was talking to Randy Schuster in Tech Ed about a totally different project. And there was a student in there making a Wayfinders map and mapping out the best pathways to buildings and the various locations of bathrooms and things like that. And I said, oh, I, yeah, I wish we could make a we've been trying to think of a way to make a map for the art collection. And Randy Schuster said, well, we can do that. I have interns. They can do it. All you have to do is show them where the art is. And so we've been doing that all semester, actually. Dolores White has been getting the little golf carts and driving these students around, and they're geotagging <laughs> the artwork. And eventually it will turn into a website, but it will be something that will eventually be interactive on your phone so you can meander around the school both outside and inside, and see all of the art. And then you can also, at some point in the future, we're hoping that you'll be able to stand in front of a piece of art. It'll have a QR code, and you can wave your phone over it, and it'll give you information about the piece, more information, a little bit of information about the artist and things like that. So that's an ongoing project, and it's a big project, but it's exciting that it's actually happening, and it's actually part way finished. They photographed all the work. They have a template website up that I can see. I don't know if, I don't think it's live for everyone else, but it will be. 
Oh, eventually. That sounds awesome. So That's a really great idea. Yeah. Because uh, and it, it, yeah. there is some fabulous art here, so that'll be wonderful yeah. for people who want to visit this campus. And, it also helps the Permanent Art Collection Committee, which you mentioned, um, keep track of the art. Well, right. yes. <laughs> so that's, that's important. Too. Yeah, <laughs> we that's don't want it to disappear. <laughs> and then we know what is where, and if it gets moved, we can actually go move like a little, they call it a node, but it's like a little virtual map tack and move to show that the piece has moved from maybe the library to another location. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. That sounds really good. So that's lots a, of innovative things in the art world here. Lots of and, projects. Yeah. And I think I met. Pat, a long time ago here at American River, when she probably first came here, where you were actually teaching art history at that time. Yes. So well, you don't do that anymore. Well, they used to call it art appreciation, <laughs> and then they changed it to intro to art history. And they used to have a lot of sections of it, and they used to ask the studio teachers to teach it. And I was teaching. I was just part-time then. I wasn't full-time yet, and I was teaching over uh, at Natomas, I think. Yes, and, that's where uh, I took your class. And you were um, one of those overachieving students. <laughs> at, uh, I think yeah. I, the one thing I remembered was, well, I loved having you in class because you had a lot of information and you were willing to share it because you've traveled some. Um, uh, and so I remember a, a lot of the night classes I'd have out there that were the introduction to art history for some reason. Um I would get a lot of nursing majors, and which were great, but I'd get nursing and I'd get um, sometimes people who, you know, physical fitness or some of the sports teams. And so I didn't necessarily have a crowd that was interested in art. It was more like I need these three units of humanities, right? <laughs> and so it was always great when you got like five, you know, at least five people in there that were really into it or maybe been to some museums and you were one of those people. <laughs> yeah, there but was I'm, a woman in the class who was an art teacher too for, yeah, for school. There's so a that few, was fun. You get, you get yeah. an art teacher once in a while, you get someone uh -huh. who's really into it. Yeah. People, well, there were a number of us into it. I think, yeah, there class. were a number of people who were like, well, I'm going to travel to Italy next year. Uh -huh. So I thought I'd take this class. So, you know, we did a little bit of the Italian uh -huh. Renaissance. And Pat says I'm an overachiever because she wanted some drawings. I, and... Yeah. So I wanted, <laughs> uh, well, I didn't want any drawing. I mean, you know, it was not a hands-on art class. But what it was was that um, I did a project. We talked about public art and what public art was. And in a nutshell, public art is artwork that is funded by the public through taxpayer money. So any of the art in the airport, that's all funded by taxpayer money. Uh, not everything you run out to in the streets, statues or sculptures, are public art. That big shiny horse in front of Safeway was paid for by the guy who owns Safeway. So you can't complain about it all, only the stuff that you help pay for with your tax money. <laughs> Those are the I only ones students. we're allowed to say anything about. <laughs> so I had students that would, or I, I would give a assignment. And the assignment was to pretend like you were awarded, I think, $80,000 to make a public art piece, what would you do? Would it be site-specific? Would it be outdoors? Blah, 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 this kind of thing. And there was extra credit if you drew a picture of it. But since it wasn't a drawing class, I just made that part extra credit. And a few people would do a little rough sketch. I think you came with a whole sculptural maquette at the end. <laughs> well, I did. Had this giant thing. <laughs> like you actually made the piece or a miniature version of the piece that you wanted to do. I did. I right. did. But I, was, so, I really got into it. What right, can I right, say? Right, right, right. So that was the, the first <laughs> art project by you that I saw. <laughs> And then yes. you came back Drawings to written in that. Yes. And then to I came back to art gallery operations. Did you take any I classes took, in between? I can't remember. With you, no. Yeah. I took lots of classes. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. With your classes, I I really think those are the only two I've taken. Yeah. I was think that, that introduction to art history and the gallery operations class. Yeah. I I had kind of taken gallery operations before, but withdrew a bit because I wasn't going to be able to put in enough hours right right back right. Right when uh, Nick Sheldon was teaching that right so, so right. I appreciated the different approaches oh good good yeah we're, we're very we're, I mean we do a lot of things the same I really That's kind right. of trained under Mick but we're also very different people yeah there are some things that Mick would do like he rotated the student show I don't do that it's all in the gallery and there are some things that I'm more flexible about uh you know I mean I don't think Mick would ever 
let anyone build a room or paint on the walls. So maybe not. <laughs> yeah. So he had some rules. I have some different rules. So that's kind of, well, I think that's a pretty good capsule of all the things that you do around here. Now, how about your art? Let's talk a little bit about your own creation and painting and your work. Yeah, I, you know, I am a painter. That's what I've trained to be. Although I'd have to say the past couple of years, I've been focused on drawing with some mixed media, some paint in there, but I just sort of refell in love with my pencils and drawing tools and have just been loving doing that. And I'm working kind of on a series of small drawings. I work on the small drawings because they're ones that I can always work on. And then, you know, when I get more time in the studio, like in the summer, generally I start experimenting more or working larger. So that's what I've been doing probably for the past couple of years. I did have a few new sketches or recent sketches in the smud show that's up right now so at smud and yes that's smud, the sacramento municipal district yes here in sacramento are you the utilities? place where most people go to pay their electricity bill right um does have art shows some people are shocked about that but you can go there during their business hours which i think is 11 to 5 or something like that monday through friday you can actually park in that little parking lot across the street. It's on 65th Street. Walk right into the building. And instead of going to the left where you pay your bill, you go to the right. And you'll see these portable walls. And there's a exhibition right now of faculty work from American River College. And I have five uh, little drawings in that. So oh, very Craig good Smith, to know. Craig Smith put that show together for us because uh -huh. he knows Lori Kempf, who coordinates the shows. So... She contacted him and said, let's have an ARC faculty show. And he put that together. He sort of organized it. And, uh, Linda Gelfman has a piece and Laura Parker has a couple of pieces. And Jody has a set of photographs and Angela Casagrandes and Joy Bertensen. And I think Sarah has three paintings. And So quite a variety of folks yeah, from ARC. Yeah. That's great. Brandy, I think, has a piece. So we've got a lot of, lot of the uh, staff participate. A lot of the faculty participated in mm -hmm. that. But um, I got my master's a long time ago, if you want a little background. I got my MFA from the University of Arizona in 1997. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, what led you to get into art in the first place? I mean, have you always been, you know, scribbling on the walls at your house when you were growing up? Or? Uh, <laughs> kind what? of, kind of. I mean, as I got into high school and stuff, art... Art classes were the only classes I was interested in. And so I was a really bad high school student. I got all A's in my art classes and not so great grades in my other classes. But then I eventually, after high school, decided, I mean, didn't, I really didn't have a plan. You know, my parents didn't go to college, and so they weren't, they, they weren't bad parents, but they weren't much of guides in terms of what to do with life. So I actually started taking classes at Sac City College. It was like way back in 1988. And I really didn't know what I was doing. I had no plan at the time to transfer. I was just sort of, you know, dawdling around taking art classes. And the first year I was probably not such a great student. <laughs> but then I got serious and mostly because I, I um, met a couple of art professors who became very influential and really encouraged me to um, continue on and to, you know, transfer and that was something I'd never even thought of. And I just, a couple of teachers, one teacher in particular, and said, why don't you go to Davis? And so I eventually got on track to transfer to UC Davis and went to UC Davis. I was actually at Davis for three years because I got, I was a double major. So I got a BA in art studio, but also studied art history. So I did both. You don't actually get two degrees, but you're a double major. So, All right. And then I... I decided part of the reason I went on, I mean, one, I wanted to go on, but I also wanted to go on because I really didn't want to be a high school teacher. I wasn't a very good high school student <laughs> and I wasn't particularly fond. <laughs> you know, I'm afraid of teenagers. Let's put it that way. You know, the whole <laughs> eye rolling and that someone forced me to be here. It's not my cup of tea. So, uh, and you yeah. would just be relating to them all the time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Been there, done that. Yes. <laughs> 
I was maybe avoiding the karma that was due me. Anyway, so I went, I went to the, I applied for a few schools and the school I got into was the University of Arizona. And I tell people that I went there because it was, you know, Sacramento just wasn't hot enough for me. So I thought I'd try out Tucson. Yeah. Too, you didn't like it cooling off in the evening, right? Too, yeah, I didn't, it was too it was too cool in the evening. So and it really does not cool off in the evening it, in Tucson. No, two AM. Las oh. Vegas and, and Phoenix are both like sizzling hot. Sizzling those, hot. You can try those cities egg. that I it's remember just terrible. the first year I was in Arizona, I was all alone. I had a little Geo Metro. I threw all, I took too much crap with me. I don't know why I took all those books with me. You know, I mean, I just had no clue what I was doing. And I drove all the way from Sacramento to Tucson, got this little apartment. So that was, I think, in 94 that I moved out there. I drove out there, my little blue Geo Metro three-cylinder. Oh, and I, I remember what I was saying. So it was, uh, it was, I think it was May, right? So I'd been out there for the semester, and it was May, and at some point in May, it hit 100 degrees, and it never cooled down beyond 95 until, I think, late October. And this was and in Tucson, you were at Tucson, In right? Tucson, and I was mm -hmm. so shocked because... You know, Sacramento gets really hot, but it'll cool down in the oh, evening. A good sometimes. twenty degrees at least. A yeah. good twenty degrees, and then we have weeks that aren't so hot, and then we ha might have a couple of weeks where it's blazing hot. It just stays hot in Tucson. It just stays <laughs> think, hot. Yeah, like I said, parts of Nevada and yes, Arizona. Yes, it goes down to a, a crisp, breezy ninety-five <laughs> at six a.m. And so it, it was shocking, and then and then eventually got used to it. And I remember the second year I was there we got a new roommate in the grad program which actually we I lived in this house with all these grad students we got a new roommate and she had just moved from Kentucky and she came late summer and by the way we lived in a house there were four grad students who lived in the house all women and we had no air condition we had a swamp uh. cooler which I think are intended to be in swampy areas <laughs> terrible so one of my roommates would go to the store and get a giant bag of popsicles and we would just sit there sweating eating popsicles all day long trying to like stay alive and this new roommate whose name was maria who came from kentucky looked at us one day and said when does it get cool and we just kind of said it kind of doesn't <laughs> And it really did. She didn't. stay in the program. She stayed. She survived. <laughs> she <Brave> stayed. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just. We had people. I, I felt so sorry for the people who were from like Boston and yeah. and Indiana. I mean, at least I was from Sacramento. I was kind of, you know, at least a little acclimated. A little bit acclimated. Now, how do art materials manage in such terrible heat? The cool thing about that program is that we all each got our own studio. I had like a 500 square foot studio, you know. Uh -huh. But they were not on campus. They were in these old bays, these where what used to be a warehouse. So there were four different bay doors that would roll, and they would go into four different parts of the buildings. And one of the professors, long before I got there, got some guys to come in and build individual studios. Now, the walls didn't go all the way up to the ceilings, but they were individual kind of drywall studios. And everybody hung, if they wanted to, hang their own door because they were just open doors that people will go find old doors and put their own door on their studios. And it was great. It was probably one of their favorite times of my life. We, we would share equipment and stuff, but it was also only swamp cooler. Oh. And I just remember working a lot at that time in oil paints and wearing latex gloves and taking them off and just like, I'm surprised my hands didn't evaporate. So much sweat would just come out of the gloves. <laughs> Consequently, you had a lot of artists working throughout the night when it was slightly cooler. I mean, right. slightly, you know, it was only 90 degrees instead of, it was literally 118 degrees there every day. And I was so poor, I used to donate, you'll love this as a doctor, I used to donate my plasma, I used to sell my plasma, not donate. Right? Uh -huh. So I actually sold what little water I had left in my body. <laughs> to, to get some money to eat, To get right? some money to eat. <laughs> oh my. Yeah. I think at the time well, you could get... That was the story of the star... Pat Wood is the starving well, artist. Was the starving artist, <laughs> yeah. So uh -huh. you get like 35 bucks for a pint of plasma, I think it was. In those days. Squeeze okay. and, you know, and it would always take them 
forever just I was like a dry lemon you know just squeezing out of me and it was just so so hot and so surreal being out in the <laughs> desert and so uh, how long you were there for like two years for an MFA or I stayed for the full three years. Oh, good. Right. No, oh, you were so a brave could, soul then, So too. you could do it in two or three, and I stayed for three, which at the time I thought was a bad thing. I thought, oh, I should have gotten out in two. And, of course, I did rake up more debt because of that. That's sort of it. But what I found out later, which I had no idea about at the time or for many years, is that here at community colleges – I'm not sure if this is true at university, but at community colleges, at least in California, you actually get a pay bump for the amount of units you graduated with. So I graduated with over 70 units towards an MFA. So I was, you know, kind of bumped up higher on the pay scale. So uh, it oh. was worth it, at least monetarily. <laughs> but it was so worth it for other reasons, too. Yeah, it was worth it for other reasons, Plus, yeah other, yeah, other reasons to so, do it. Um, the experience of being around other students yeah. as well as the, well, getting I'm the instruction. Well, I'm still in touch with a lot of those people. I, I just recently had, I didn't go to it, but a high school reunion, 30 years, I think. Was it 40, 30? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> think about we don't that. want to calculate. And no. I don't want to calculate. And I didn't go to it, but I have some friends that I grew up with. I've got to go, got to go. And it's like, I just, I don't remember most of those people. And I just kind of don't care. That sounds bad. But, well, but you but were to, goofing uh, off. <laughs> yes, maybe we that's know that High school was but not I didn't your, fit in. your I didn't strength. Fit. I didn't, you know, yeah. I have nothing really in common. I mean, a lot of those people, other than the few that I've, I'm still good friends with, there's the only thing we have in common is that we're the same age. Yeah. You know, but graduate school, we're all still artists, you know, um, and some of us are making different art than we were back then. And some of us are teaching. Some of us are doing other things to make an income. But a, but a lot of us are artists. So believe it or not, a, a probably a handful of us ended up in California. And so Hale Nyesmet, who had a big show here last semester, those beautiful paintings that were about her son, one of the bodies of work about her son who has autism. Yeah. I know her from grad school. We were oh, in Arizona yeah. together, and she ended up being a full-time professor at Modesto Junior College, of all places. Yeah. And so, you know, I reconnected with her. We had a figurative show a few years back with three women and one of the artist was Stephanie Ryan. She's a full-time professor at Fresno State. I went to grad school with her. So I called her up and said, would you be willing to bring your paintings? Oh, you know, so your class had has uh, established themselves here in yeah. the Central Valley so, of California. Yeah, That's quite wonderful. a few people, and they're yeah. really um, both amazing artists. In fact, that little collage up there in the white frame is Stephanie's. I uh -huh. might take a picture of that to put that in the show notes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Because so, um, obviously no one's seeing it as we're discussing it. But, but we it's a it fabulous piece, so yes, you'll just have is. to trust us on that. <laughs> well, or, and check out the show notes. Yeah, and check out the show notes. Right. But, uh, yeah. So were there any major influences that you can say influenced you to become a teacher or become a painter? Or where would you say your main inspiration came? Like I said, I was always into art, and then I think it was my community college teachers who pushed me to do it more seriously. And then at that point, I was on the path. I was on the path already, even though I, you know, I wasn't certain I would have gotten into an MFA program or if I wanted to do that, but I was headed in that direction. And so when I graduated, when I got my MFA in 97, I was kind of a bit at a, a crossroads, you know, because here I was in Arizona and a lot of people, you know, in my class, they were graduating. There were like 13 of us and it was kind of, you had to figure out, are you going to stay here? Are you going to go back from where you came from? Or are you going to go somewhere else? As much as I loved Arizona, Tucson at the time, I'm sure it's different now, but at the time had only three real galleries, one community college, Pima Community College a very small arts commission. And so what that meant is there just weren't a lot of jobs, you know, very small museum. And like I said, I think it's different now, but there weren't a lot of jobs. And so I started thinking about California and how big California was and that 
you know, even just within driving distance from Sacramento, there's four community colleges in Los Rios. There's the Sierra College District. Cheney is having the ceramic show at Coneco. Is at Stockton, Delta Community College. And so I just knew that there was going to be a lot more employment opportunity. And honestly, I missed the water. I did. That, I mean, it just, yeah. I love the cactuses and stuff, but when you grow up next to rivers and lakes, and the interesting thing about Tucson is you, you I mean, I remember complaining to, I, I waited tables when I was in grad school and kind of complaining, but there's no water, there's no river. And my boss at the time, the guy who owned the restaurant said, oh, well, there's Rito River, kind of gave me directions to it. And it was basically a ditch. It was a <laughs> cement ditch. Until it rained in the mountains and Until then there's a flash a flood, flash right? Flood. <laughs> but it just was so very different of what we consider bodies of water here right. in California. We used to even drive up to Mount Lemon and Rose Canyon Lake, I think it was called, was really, a, to a California girl, a pond, a really big pond, not any kind of lake. And so it was just, there just wasn't enough water, you know, I just, so that was another reason. And we're fortunately having a year this year where our rivers are incredibly full and we yeah. have uh, almost too much yeah. water, but yeah. And there was nothing in, but they're beautiful. as much as I love Tucson, there was nothing in there in Arizona that was making me stay. I didn't have yeah. a job. I wasn't in a relationship at the time with anyone there and there were no employment prospects. I'd gotten my degree, my roommates who were graduating, one of them was going back to Boston, you know, and so it was kind of like, well, even my friends, a lot of the people I bonded with aren't going to be here. So I drove back to California with exactly $40. That's all the money I had. Uh-huh. Went back home, lived with my sister for a while, then got out, you know, had to do the uh, waiting tables things. But then I got a job at one of the short centers, which was a fine art center for uh, adults with developmental disabilities. And so I taught art there, but I also coordinated a bunch of art shows in the community. And it got me really involved in the arts community. I had a studio on Edgewater with other artists. So that was cool. And I started having exhibitions. And at one point, I decided that whatever I did in terms of a job, I wanted it to be art related. And I let that path take me wherever it took me. And it took me from Peter Cottontail's garden to prison. <laughs> uh-huh, that was the next job. Oh, but I was teaching cool. there. I wasn't putting the slammer for anything. So, <laughs> but, uh, I, I assume. That, yeah, so I, yeah, it, was pretty, so from... it was pretty surreal because there was one day when I would go in the morning and teach it, I think it was the same day or the day before, where I would teach little kids in fairy tale town, literally in Peter Cottontail's garden. You know? uh-huh. And then I have to get in my car and drive to the Youth Authority or Folsom Lake, the new Folsom Lake prison. I did a variety of those prisons. And so it was like art kind of everywhere. I've taught to every community. I would just go from one place to the other, you know, hauling around art supplies. And it was a very interesting surreal experience (laughs) and then you had the opportunity to come to the college yeah it was actually in 2004 I started teaching here part-time and then in 2006 I started teaching at Sierra College part-time so Uh I was at Sierra for quite a long time too and I had all those other jobs up until about 2015 that's when I finally left the short center it you know it was one of those jobs that didn't pay very well but I got all kinds of uh, benefits my health benefits and all that from it and it was a lot of fun, and you could make art with students all day long. and So it was great in a lot of ways. But I had picked up a bunch of teaching gigs at the Crocker Art Museum. I still sometimes teach there. And so, and then in 2016, I got the full-time job here. Actually, I got the phone call in 2016, December, but I started full-time in 2017. So I think it's my second full-time. And i got to tell you, one of the nicest things about it is that I have an office. I don't have to take this stuff home with me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, especially when you're going from job to job. Yeah, I just had to haul everything back and forth. And, <laughs> and it was like the greatest thing was this office and bringing everything that was work-related here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that was the 2017 is when I started, though. Oh, oh very Spring, good. Spring, 
and been full-time here ever since and gave up all of those other crazy jobs, freeway flyers, what they call us, and I worked all kinds of gigs. I can't even remember them all, but taught art, always art, in lots of different places from the museums to prisons to Davis Art Center, little kids and adults and just all over. A lot of artists do these gigs. Um, but that was the thing I kind of knew about California is that these things would be available. Tucson at the time was such a small art community. I just knew that, that you know, one or two jobs available. And uh, here you could really, you know, I mean, I worked my butt off. There were times I was working a lot of jobs and driving everywhere. But I can also say I was never unemployed as yeah. an artist. I was never unemployed. So Jody Hooker and I have talked about this. She said she hasn't been unemployed one day. But, you know, you do the gigs. Some of them are fun. Some of them are crazy. Sometimes you, you end up doing, you know, you got a weird crowd you're teaching to and, you know, or you're, <laughs> you're in a very gray prison, like I said, although. So yeah. you're, the show, of course, is about creativity. And I guess you get to see creativity in all different areas of life when you work in so many different venues. You do. There, there's no limit. There's yeah. no limit, really. There's no population that doesn't benefit from art. Yeah. And so maybe you want to reflect a little bit about your, you know, we usually end up all our interviews here talking about just some general thoughts about creativity. Yeah. Well, I think I have found that, there, like I've said, there's no community that cannot benefit from it. It can be brought to any any group. It is more... I think, versatile and expansive than any other topic. And so working with the Youth Authority or a lot of those other places where you see teenagers who've never done art before, with teenagers that were incarcerated and seeing the talent that they have and trying to say, trying to encourage them, this is a path, a different pathway that you can take. Or seeing kids, you know, just kids are much more free with art, you know, paint everywhere, but it's fun because they don't have the sort of hang-ups that adults have of trying to make a, I've got to be the best drawer, I've got to make this the most perfect thing, you know. There's a creativity there. But my thought about children in art is that children are always better at composition, always, because they'll fill the page. You know, by the time you get to adulthood, we get floating objects and we've rendered a perfect teacup, but it's right in the middle of the page. We haven't paid attention to the whole page anymore. You know, so <laughs> something that was always fascinating to me. <laughs> but I've seen the, the benefits of art. And, you know, I don't know. People have different opinions, like art therapy and those types of things. And I think my, my biggest opinion is that uh, art, art may not fix people, but I do think it saves people. It becomes a, an outlet or a focus even if it's not done professionally. I think everyone should go into the arts. Everyone should have something. Because art is something, I think, that you... And I, and I suppose this is not just... I'm, I'm talking from visual art standpoint, but this could be music or this could even be writing. Is it something that can be entirely yours alone? And I've always needed that. And I've also seen people who maybe had a partner or something pass away. And they don't have their very own thing. And you have to have your own one thing that you do that's kind of a selfish thing that you want to do for yourself that doesn't require anyone else. That's something that you can always go to. And you can go to when you're feeling bad, feeling good, feeling angry. You always have that thing, that outlet. And it's always something you can do, even with physical limitations, you know. And I say that because if your outlet is running or something, you hurt your ankle and there you are stuck in front of the TV. But, you know, there's always a way to get to a paintbrush or a pencil. Even artists I've seen who use their mouse and their feet because they're physically limited. So I don't know. That's I think people should have some some artistic outlet. And it doesn't matter if you paint the perfect still life. That's not what it's about. Certainly there's people who want to go into it as a career, but it doesn't have to be a career. It can just be something that's yours. That's something you do. And that's how I, you know, a lot of students, we have a a lot of students who come in um, after they're retired from very impressive careers like you, Karen, (laughs) you know, there's probably about 20 regular students who come and take all of the art classes. I just had a student in printmaking. She ended up having to leave because she went on a longer vacation, but she was a retired lawyer. You know, retired lawyers, retired doctors. And these people who have always wanted to make art, maybe made art 
when they could, but if you have a career as a lawyer, as a surgeon, your time is really limited, <laughs> but they come back to it, you know, and um, that's like a whole other socioeconomic group that, that embraces art. Um, and I think that's pretty important, you know. Well, thank you, Pat. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Loved hearing more about you, even though I've known you a while. There's, yes. uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. And thank you for being part of a Creative Approach podcast. Well, thank you very much. It's a really good conversation. Oh, good. Thanks good. again. Thank you. Thanks again for joining me at the podcast. The creative world of Pat Wood likely has given you many insights into the life of artists and ideas of how art can be a personal passion and not just a career. Now, as always, I'm reminding you to visit the webpage for not only the show notes, which are very comprehensive for this episode, but on the webpage, there's an opportunity to join the mailing list and to leave audio feedback. Check out the Patreon tab on the website. I hope that you'll enjoy the stories that you find there. If you'd like to support the show with even a dollar a month via Patreon, your generosity would be most welcome. While online, do go to Facebook and join our Creative Approach podcast page. Your questions and feedback on the show are welcome on our Facebook group page, so join there as well. I want to remind you to become a subscriber to a Creative Approach podcast on your favorite podcast platform if you've not done so already. Please join me in future conversations at a Creative Approach podcast. I hope you will find inspiration to make things, tell your story, and explore a creative approach to life.